talking about building. Well, so thank today you we're gonna... and uh, welcome to another <laughs> episode right. of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm your host, Richard Restucia, and today we're going to be talking about something I'm really interested in, and that is uh, building profitable greenhouses. Now, I say I'm interested in this because you know, when I think about different ways for people to get involved in agriculture, you know, uh, for, for a lot of people, uh, starting in the greenhouse industry is a, is a great way to get started. And uh, fortunately for us, uh, we've got Kevin Shortell joining us. And Kevin's uh, going to really focus on some of the key economic considerations for success in building a greenhouse, right? So certainly uh, you may be thinking about building a greenhouse or adding a greenhouse to your already existing operation. And uh, he's going to go through all the things you should consider so that as you are successful and keep growing, uh, you'll be prepared for this and you won't have to go back and uh, do it over or do it right the second time. So uh, <laughs> anyway, for those of you who know Kevin, uh, you know that he's been in this industry for over 30 years. He's worked in Canada, Mexico, the United States. He's the former president of the Irrigation Association Greenhouse Nursery Common Interest Group. He has a wealth of knowledge in an area where it is hard to find people with a wealth of knowledge. So we're really lucky to have him on here today. Uh, Kevin, welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Hey, I'm really happy to be here. And I just, I want to start out with saying this is geared toward if you're buying an existing greenhouse, what to look for, or if you're starting from scratch, I will tell you that you absolutely can make money in this segment of the industry, as long as, you know, you're willing to, to start out you know, the old back to basics. Um, one thing that you really need to always consider, number one, I'm going to say it about 50 times during this presentation, is do you have enough water? Hmm. You need to know where your water is coming from. You know, Richard, you know that in, in California, there's a lot of reclaim water. There's a lot of, you know, different, whether it's from roof or from uh, reclaim from municipal, well water, uh, no matter where your water is coming from, day one irrigation suitability test and the other thing is you will never have too much water yeah, you know it's, it's interesting kevin we were talking yesterday for a little bit uh -huh. and um I, I really didn't know right and and many of us think that you have plenty of water wherever you go in the united states right and um mm -hmm. and we, we know that's not completely true but that's the that's the thing people think of so uh but, I, I was, go ahead i'm sorry Richard. So I was surprised to see that we actually have, you know, that this is a consideration, right? That not only do I have water, enough water, but in peak periods, I have enough. So, so I had three beautiful daughters and their average hair length was about, you know, if you added it up, it was six feet tall. Yeah. And they would come home from school at three. They would take a shower. Mom would cook dinner. Um, I'd go out and wash the car. So between three and six o'clock in Orlando, you weren't going to irrigate your greenhouse with the same amount of water pressure that you had earlier in the morning or off peak hours. So that that's something to consider that your water source needs to be consistent and that you need to have some type of backup, whether it's a reservoir, whether it's a well or some way of blending. We can get into that in some detail later. You also need to start out with a consistent budget and you need to do, you know, analysis on a daily basis. You should be able to walk in that greenhouse and look at a section of your bench and say, that bench made me X amount of money today. Mm. You know, and that starts at the uh, initial phases of designing that greenhouse, designing the efficiencies in. So for example, a mid-range greenhouse is going to cost you roughly $15 and 63 cents a square foot. And that is not a glass Dutch greenhouse. That's, that's basic functional greenhouse. And then if you go into the higher range and by higher range, I mean more climate control, um, the ability to have more zones, more efficiency because you can you know, get out of the monoculture world. Now, if you get into indoor grow, you're completely controlling your environment and that comes at a price and your average indoor grow is 10,000 you know, square feet. So you're looking at a million dollars for your average, um, as, as you like, as it, the industry likes to say, campus. Um, but, you know, that that's important. And then if you look at the land footprint of a typical horticultural greenhouse, it's going to be two acres. And a lot of that is because of drainage. You know, R Richard, you, you've seen it in, in your world when you occasionally get rain. 
you know, that, that rain has to go somewhere. Okay. That's one thing to think about. The second thing to think about, and this is critical is nitrate infiltration. So they may want you to put a retention pond with plants that can do bioremediation around the retention pond or basically absorb the nitrates that you're, the fertilizers, the, the leachates, nitrate, things that you're, you're constantly adding to your plant. If they don't use it, it goes back into nature. So that, that is important. Yeah, we have a question on that too, Kevin. Sure. And I just want to remind everybody, I've got the Q&A open and the chat Absolutely. open. Absolutely. And certainly for people with the good questions, uh, we'll send them some uh, rivulous gear after the uh, webinar. So uh, the first question is, uh, so this uh, holding pond or areas that you're, you're talking about is mm -hmm. how much, so a regular greenhouse, like we're talking about here, 96 by 30 structure, how much okay. no, that, that, we that... have to put that, that is a great question, and a lot of that is zoning laws, but there's also something called best management practices, typically. So at one point, I collected the best management practices for every state, and I still have access to it. It may not be current, so I encourage you to look at your local association and review it. But, you know, the idea is um, I believe in self-governance, so that if you, if you come in and you say, hey, this is what was recommended to me, generally, it's easier to get a permit. Yeah. And it's also a good idea. But, you know, the you got to remember, you're putting a giant umbrella out with your structure. All that water is going somewhere. And then you're constantly irrigating and all that water is going somewhere. Um, I can't answer for your state, of course, not knowing where you are, but I can. Uh, you, my email will be provided at the end of the presentation. So I'll go ahead and get that information to you. So, you know, water shortages are, are a reality. Um, so you need to look at historical data. So we're, we're at this 89 year, um, depending on where you are, drought stage. Well, what happened 89 years ago was the Dust Bowl. So, you know, if you, if you look at trends, um, you know, I think once we get out of this trend, you're, we're gonna be good for a while. Um, I just personally went through the 100 year flood. I think I'm okay for the next one. <laughs> but the other, other options that you have, so, I'm designing a greenhouse and I haven't considered, uh, I have considered everything, including um, cleaning up biosecurity, making sure everything, I'm, I have water to wash, I have water to irrigate, I have water to do frost protection, evaporative cooling, propagation. So, you know, you can never have too much water, but I have a limited supply. Let's say I can only get a four inch well, I need a six inch, but I have municipal. So, um, the world hates a vacuum. Technology came in with the answer for a relatively inexpensive. Now, let's let's say for an average multiple range greenhouse, we're looking at thirty thousand dollars. Typical fertigation machines like the ones that we sell can do what's called blending. So you're measuring the EC and pH coming in from different sources. So a well in municipal, a well in reclaimed wearing water, a well in and uh, canal, whatever, and seeing the pH coming in, making adjustments in microseconds so that the plant always gets the consistent EC and pH. It's relatively straightforward, it's relatively affordable, but if you're on that edge of design, make sure that you consider multiple water sources and always consider that you do not have enough water to do what you're doing. Right. That's so. that's so interesting because um, so I, I can figure or I know, right, scientifically, mm -hmm. pH value, the plants uh, yeah. prefer and I, I can dial that in. Mm -hmm. And also, there you know, there's a point of diminishing return and it depends on what stage of the plant or what you're trying to accomplish. It also, you know, we've gotten to the stage, Richard, now this is not today's topic, but we're actually taking, you know, NPK and in, in, in its rawest forms and making your fertilizer mix for you. And I've done as many as 12 different ingredients to make that special sauce for a specific plant. Um, we can get the climate control now where your orchids can bloom at your daughter's wedding on July 2nd wow. in California. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy, but you can take technology as far as you want or, um, or keep it in a narrow focus and expensive focus. So right, we, when you... We do have another question coming in, Kevin. Yeah. And this person's asking about, uh, uh, can I reclaim or recapture the water I use in my greenhouse, uh, treat it and reuse it? 
Okay, so th that's going to require a different level of treating. You want a UV. You want to sterilize that water only because you don't want any pathogen to be reintroduced into your greenhouse. So if you had, um, in, 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 you know, the way, and again, not to get off topic, because I'm really good at that, but you don't want to create a bacterial bloom by just uh, by chemical treatment. I like UV. And then you also want to pay attention to your EC, and you might need to freshen it up a little bit. You don't want your salts to go too high. But sure, it's done all the time. Uh, absolutely. Um, not a problem with that. Yeah. And okay. it's actually good. It's a good BMP practice. So, so going into it, you need to decide, can I make money? You know, I am a fantastic grower, but you need a market. That's the first thing that you need to decide. Then you also, hey, I've got a unique way to approach this market. Like um, Wolfgang Engelman, one of the biggest growers in Apopka, came up with Ag Angels. It was a marketing ploy. It's hmm. the same plants, but oh my gosh, he created a market for himself because um, there, there was room to expand. He just found the key to get into that market. Then you also need to look at, can I, do I have the patience and the financial uh, wherewithal to wait the three to four years it takes to get a return on my investment? Because if you get into, I'm, I'm specifically talking about pay for scan. So Richard, you're growing flowers for one of the big box retailers and it's sitting in the store. And you see, we've all seen them. They're you know, not being watered. They're they're in racks. They're dying in the sun. Whatever, that's completely on you, the grower. Yeah. And then for one year after that, a homeowner can return it. So it doesn't seem like much. But what if there was a hail event? What if there was a hurricane? Whatever. Home Depot is going to take them back. And it's on you. And even if it's five percent, now excluding taxes, I don't want my income, you know, I don't want to pay on something I've already received the income for because that's part of my budget. It's hard to budget for that unknown. So you need to make sure if you're going to deal with the box retailers that you have budgeted for that. But that's the segment of the horticulture market that makes money. The ones that are going, um, the local businesses, you know, the, the medium-sized roadside greenhouses, that's the segment that's making the money. The box retailers, the Home Depots and Lowe's are mostly contract grow. Yes, you will make money, but it is the more challenging part of the industry. Is, is this um, is this industry like other parts of ag where, you know, you don't grow it until you've already sold it? That's a, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, unless you're creating, yes, you need to make sure that you have a customer base. Like I can grow some of the best hot peppers in the world. They're fantastic. I think my hot sauce is one of the best in the world, but I don't have a market for it. Yeah. I always overgrow, you know, just, you know, so you need to, that's a consideration when you're, when you're getting into this, whether you want to do a monoculture or you want to hedge your bet and have multiple, um, multiple aspects, or again, I'll say this many times during the presentation, join the local greenhouse nursery association and Hey, Richard, I uh, understand you got the Home Depot compact uh, contract. You need any backup. If I grow for you, can you increase your contract? Because next year your contract will be larger. So you benefit by helping me out in my first years. Yeah. Which is so, kind of nice. Yeah. So then they uh they help each other that way. So this is an industry it's, that helps. 100 percent I want you to have the best flowers when you go to market. I want uniformity, 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 so that when I go, when the buyer comes in to price me and he goes from your greenhouse to my greenhouse. We both bring the best product product to market, and we could set the price for it. So it's 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 unique. Um, in these thirty years, but my experience that they help each other. Yeah, you know. So that uh, so that actually brought me to a, to a good point, Richard. Thank you. So so look at your neighbors. Um, so I live in Florida. It's the third largest concentration of greenhouses, but they're only in two parts of Florida, really. The, the large <laughs> concentrations. Greenhouses make great neighbors for greenhouses. The um, residential houses, not so much. And uh, when you're looking at, at the greenhouses, I, this is a true story, but it's, it's one of those funny stories that you love to tell. I had a friend of mine who wanted to, to grow orchids and I went to visit the site. You know, they asked me to take a look at it. It was right next to where they were growing mushrooms. So you do mm -hmm. not want to put your orchid greenhouse next to a mushroom greenhouse. That's bad. You also want to make sure that your neighbors are committed to ag long-term. 
that they're not going to sell out to a road because that also, which blocks the sun. You know, you don't want a, a flyover right by your greenhouse and then all the dust and dirt and construction. You don't want that nice ag property to become houses and schools because that's extra demands on your well. So you need a little bit of, you need to be a futurist when you get, like any other business. You need to understand um, labor laws. So Richard, I'm going to pick on you a little bit because it's one of the craziest. There is actually a law that tells you how long your, your pruning shears can be in California in a greenhouse. Now, if I am, I'm short, so I've never been down, but if I was your height and I'm bending down and working on something, it's a hundred dollar a day fine. Wow. If those, yeah, it's crazy, but it is something to consider when, if, if you're going to move into an area that is not business friendly and certainly not ag friendly, I wouldn't consider it. Um, also, you know, this is agriculture. It's noisy. It smells funny. There's a lot of movement. So you want to make sure that you're surrounded by like businesses. So um, this is one of my favorite expressions. Everything in life breaks down to, you know, I will be, I would be a fantastic basketball player if I was about three feet taller. Hmm. Uh, there's certain, th I mean, I, things you cannot do without. So affordable labor, transportation, three phase electricity, which is, this is the most often overlooked thing, you know, because a lot of greenhouses are built on former pasture land. Hmm. so they just don't have it they've never had a need for it before and it could be upwards of a hundred thousand dollars to move it to your facility so it's a huge consideration um when you look at how you're using your water and again irrigation propagation climate control frost protection biosecurity which basically means cleaning um factor all these things in and then 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 add a little bit of a safety factor but you're not going to be successful unless you the first thing you consider i'm in the right location i've got the right neighbors i've got water labor you need to look at the structure now now when you're designing the structure become friends with your builder the classic mistake and i've seen this happen quite a lot is a builder comes from florida where we have two thousand percent humidity and tries to help you out and give you suggestions for a greenhouse in Arizona, or or when someone who's building greenhouses in um, St. Ramey or um, Canada, and they come to Florida and they build these incredible greenhouses that don't allow for the air movement that we require in Florida. So find a builder that's used to the environment. Look at the climate history, it's out there, it goes back a hundred years. See what these weird events that will repeat themselves typically. Understand the wind load if you're in Florida and we have the tropical storms. Understand the, the, the weight of the snow. You want a slight southern slope of 1% to 2%. So, Richard, have you ever carried slope out across two acres? Yeah, no. It, it's impressive. It's yeah. impressive, yeah. So, you, you know, do it with a transit. Like, don't, don't take, you know, that's another classic mistake is make sure that it's actually measured with it. Because the human eye will fool you, but it's a huge elevation change when you carry that over two acres yeah so Kevin, because, is, yeah are there greenhouse designers i should talk to do the greenhouse uh, manufacturers supply this expertise do i rely on you who, who, who do i talk to about this you need to build a team and, and your team starts with a certified irrigation designer followed by a local dealer a reputable manufacturer that stands by their products very important and a builder that is used to what you're doing, and then input from your neighbors and the local irrigation, so a local uh, greenhouse nursery association, because they'll tell you who works. That they will absolutely. Hey, I've used Richard before on this project. He's great. He's amazing. Make sure you book him six months in advance, because he's out. Um, he's he's in uh, Santa Barbara fishing. This you know, between. The, but it's really important that you have reputable builder. Start with a certified irrigation designer. The Irrigation Association has some great resources for you, too. Don't overlook those. Uh, they're out there. These guys are very grower centric. So, you know, it's it's a uh, an industry that's that's basically full of manufacturers, but we are geared to doing the right thing. Um, learn your local best management practices. That's important. And then when you're picking your audience, always have a plan, a plan B. You know, never, um, never. I'm not a great believer in monoculture. You know, you need different varieties. Even even in indoor grow, you need specialties. 
something that sets you apart from the pack. So um, when you design a greenhouse, think that, oh, my, this contract might be over someday. Can I switch to this? Do I have enough water to do this? If this fails, can I do this? Yeah, I, I Under, think this makes yeah. so much sense, Kevin, because I think typically people in the green industry, whether they're ag growers mm -hmm. or landscape, yeah. they tend to be really independent people, really strong-willed independent people. Oh, yeah. And uh, boy, you're right. That team is out there that you it mentioned is. to help you and uh, you, you should take advantage of it. I think that's a great suggestion. Oh, you know, if you look at the library between Jane and Rivulus and the history, including, you know, how big is the tissue culture lab that we work with? I mean, there's a lot of horsepower even within this group that, that's out there to help you. I mean, we're here to help you. And then, you know, the other thing to consider is the crop. So you, so you're going to get everybody in this audience will get scared because there've been some recent failures of some of the vegetable greenhouses. But a lot of that was because they were in more into monoculture, 28 day crops. Now that's the bad news. The good news is a lot of these properties have been sold to people that are into the higher value crops, which would be your peppers, strawberries, and so on. So, um, you know, keep in mind that if you're going to make a big investment, I it works and it, you'll absolutely make money on a 28 day crop, but you need to be extremely efficient. I was talking specifically about a lettuce and microgreens. Yes, yeah. there is a market for it, but you need to control your costs. You know, that that's when you can't let get away from you. Right. You know, so. Kevin, we got a few more questions coming in. That sure. Great. Uh, one, I love one question questions. Is uh, I think when you were talking about your grade and your slope over two acres, you're yeah. saying, would it make sense to drain towards the middle so you wouldn't have to uh, uh, manage that grade change so much? Okay, so uh, yes and no. Um, I, I mean, absolutely, depending on local zoning laws and where they require you to put your drainage. In sometimes it's an aesthetic consideration. You know, you wanna use gravity, not pumps, mm. whenever you can, use nature. You know, even in your design of your greenhouse. So, so let's say you were dealing with something in the vegetative state needed ten hours of light. If you can get eight hours free in the Florida sun, go for it. Because so it's it's the same thing with drainage. That is something that wait when you talk to the builder, make sure that you know and permitting that you make all the considerations. Put the gutters in the concrete at first. Don't go in later with a jackhammer and oh yeah. We should have dragged it through the center of the greenhouse. Let's do that. Um, really good question. Yes, it, that, that's a fairly common practice. Okay, and next question. Thank you. So the next question is, um, are there any universities still teaching uh, greenhouse design and management? So look at the land-granted universities, um, you know, Purdue, University of Florida, so on. Um, absolutely. Uh, Texas A&M actually has a really interesting, and they're getting into the, they have a lot of the uh, greenhouses on rooftop greenhouses. Ah. They actually have a demo lab of rooftop greenhouses, which is pretty interesting. Then we have Citra in Florida, if you want to take it to the insane level, they actually measure all the leachates the plant takes out and do a total water research. That is not commercially viable at the moment. But it is interesting if you if you want to come and see it, I'm sure I can arrange a visit. Yeah, that's, that's so the answer. Cool. So the answer is yes. Yeah, that's very cool. I, I would like to see that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then another question uh, is about the problems with contract growing. Are are there issues with that? So, not all contracts last forever, and um, you just need to have a backup plan. That's number one. And then you need to, uh, it's been my experience that most people play nice within the group. Hmm. Um, you just have to make sure that, you know, I'm not talking about price fixing, but you have an understanding of the value of your crop and that you do everything you can to maintain the value of your crop. So it, it's very important, especially if you're dealing with some of the larger growers. Now, the, the, the gateway may be growing for the grocery stores. Because now we're getting these big, huge, you know, like Publix and Kroger's and so on, these larger grocery stores, Nature's Way and um, Whole Foods, that might be the better entry into the market because they tend to take better care of their plants because they don't want to have sick and dying plants next to their, um, 
fruits and vegetables. So, so contract growing for the uh, grocery stores might be an easier, easier way to get into the market. Mm. So, so, so one of the keys, if you're entering the market, get the top 100 list and stay off of it for the first four years. Okay. Learn. That's your learning curve. Yeah. All right. Now that that's important. So. All right. So, so we talk about different grows, but you know, indoor growth, profitable, hard to get into, very expensive vegetable greenhouses. Think beyond the 28 day crops. So Richard, I have a question for you. What percentage of the food that we consume in the United States is imported at the moment? Imported. Oh, this is a good question. You, I, I would think I would know this, but I, I actually don't. I'm just going to guess about uh, okay. 40%. 65. Okay. So, so we are going to have to move to a vegetable greenhouse model. It's coming, but we need to be super efficient. And it's going to be, you know, take out the fuel to move food to the. So what you're going to see are hyper efficient greenhouses at the grocery store level. And they're all going to be managed by people. And that's going to be a nice, huge spark to the industry. Biopharma. Now, this uh, I'll speak specifically. I take a quarter of a blood pressure pill, which is amazing because as hyper as I am, you think I would be trike with an elephant tranquilizer. But the um, it's bitter melon. It's the same thing I eat in a salad in a Chinese restaurant. But when grown at the pharmaceutical level, because of the restrictions, it is an extremely profitable thing to grow. So, so that's that's a segment when you talk about contract grow, you get into that again by proving yourself as a grower and then making friends in the in the association, and getting yourself out there, getting yourself known. Um, Color and Woody Ornamental is they have made money for the last five years. They've gone completely off the radar. If you ask them, they will tell you we do not make money. But anyone below the top 100 list had made money in the last five years. And here's an interesting thing. This, this always blew my mind. So, so people wonder how I could guess correctly. Well, you just look at the variables. A variable for a successful horticultural greenhouse, woody ornamental color, is high interest rates. Hmm. Because when you have high interest, it's hard to sell a house. I could sell my house right now, not cut the grass for a month, Um you know, hang laundry on the line. 1,500 people moved to Florida a day. It's very easy. Interest rates are ticking up. Now, if I, you know, at a year from now, if I want to sell my house, I'm going to have to have all fresh color, new plants and so on. And then when it, someone else buys my house, they're going to rip out what I did and they're going to put in their own mark. And then you look at um, what people are doing staycations, including myself, and I'm looking at my yard. It's so look a little raggedy. And, you know, I can, I'm in the industry. I'm really going to pump it up. So, High interest rates, better sales for horticultural greenhouses. Just thought that was a neat thing. Yeah, one other thing, you know, that I was noticing, and this was really pre-COVID, I saw mm -hmm. a lot more greenhouses popping up in uh, urban environments to support absolutely restaurants. Yeah, and then, and then eating out, you know, slowed down, uh, and oh. uh, and then this concept of having a greenhouse at a at uh, your grocery store is um, you know, well, it, as well. It, it's it, Richard's it's also, you know, like Russian pickles. There's a huge market for that. I'm not sure anybody eats them, but they're at, they're at every table and, and, you know, specific restaurants, um, certain teas. We can now grow coffee in Florida. But mm. all so, so your tomatoes, your peppers, all the things you think of field crops are all started in the greenhouse, including coffee. So, you know, everything we eat starts in the greenhouse in some form or another, whether it's seed or tissue culture. And if you look at, um, the cost of ownership and your constant analysis, you need to look at who am I competing with for labor? That is critical. You need to look at the cost of labor and seasonal labor. If I'm, a, if I'm into horticulture, I'm into color, I want to make sure Valentine's Day, Christmas, all Easter, all the big holidays, I've got labor. You need to look at discounts for off-peak use of electricity, quality, and consistency. Richard, you move out in the middle of a pasture land, I guarantee you the, the electricity is going to be a little sketchy. Right. So, I'll, you know, before I go, like day one, when I turn on the lights, I don't want them blinking. So I would check that before I, I flick those switch. Um, you also need to look at, are there subsidies for heating and cooling? Now that seems, you live in, you live in paradise, Richard, but the biggest concentration of greenhouses are in Leamington, Ontario, Canada, mm -hmm. where the government subsidizes their heating. And in certain parts of the world, they actually, well, um, 
they actually have thermal heat that you can pull from the ground store and use in the greenhouses. In Alaska, there's a lot of incentives for heating to bring business and, and commerce. You need to look at you know business business friendly environment. It's important also to look at how how is your land going to appreciate because a lot of times that's your bank. So mm -hmm. you know, is there a trend of that value of the land going up? So that's something to consider, you know, if it's a good location, good transportation, good labor, the odds are the land will go up in value over time. That's also your retirement because when you sell the greenhouse, you know, you want the land value. I have beat this one to death. I've said it three times, but if you look at it, you know, because this kills me, everybody thinks about this after the fact you want three phase because look at how your usage goes down when you go from 110 to 220 to three phase. And that is a reoccurring cost, sometimes 24 hours a day. So very yeah. important, yeah, that, it, that you know that that's available when you're looking at sites. Yeah, 25% of the uh, single phase, wow. Isn't that crazy? And, and nobody considers it because, yeah, I got 220. Well, okay, but, you know, it, and th th there are ways to, I mean, there are ways to get around it. But again, that's another part of the investment that if it's already there, you don't have to make. You know, the, the other thing is, so, so I want you to look at the big seven because I listed nine here. I did that deliberately because everybody thinks of water and light. Right. Nobody thinks of root zone temperature. Nobody thinks of wind load. You know, is this thing going to blow over? That's really important. But you also have to think of air movement. Uh, humidity, temperature, CO2, nutrients, and oxygen are the seven most, let's rephrase that, most neglected things for a startup greenhouse. Um, you need to also understand biosecurity. I am a huge person in, for biosecurity because I've seen people, I quit growing tobacco because of tobacco virus. It's horrible. And then they walk through a wet field and walk in their greenhouse and they're growing hemp, which is, by the way, also tobacco virus is quite bad for hemp. <laughs> so you need to have wash stations set up. You need to have positive pressure on all your exits. In other words, you're not sucking in the bugs. You open it up, get a little vacuum, the bugs come in. All yeah, done by that, air movement, yeah. That's really take, takes you out of business. Yes, sir. Very quickly, okay. yeah. Kevin, I also want, we have a question here too. You know, this is biosecurity. What about security in general? Um, you know, are these greenhouses getting broken into? Okay, so uh, the short answer is um, if it's a horticultural greenhouse, it's typically a kid thing, you know, curiosity. Um, indoor grow, you want as much security as possible and they, you want a little bit of isolation. Um, so the rules are a little different. Vegetable greenhouses are 24 seven operation. It'll be hard to break into those. But uh, yeah, you need to consider security and, and location. Uh, you need visibility from the road. Ca cameras are great now. So you can usually catch somebody before they get into your greenhouse. Yeah. You know, that, that technology has come a long way. Uh, they actually have cameras right now that can, like a grower can check the health of his plants if he needed to remotely. <laughs> okay. Now, this will become a much longer presentation. I know nobody wants that. So if you look at if you look at your uh, owning your environment, really important. You need to be able to introduce fresh air. You need relative humidity based on historical data, because I can tell you for at least five hours a year, Florida has the best humidity of any state. Mm. And then I'm I'm in a petri dish. So you need to know, you know, um, what it's like twelve months out of the year. You know, that's very important. And, you know, when we talk about light input, so technology on light has changed. So when we talk about control, owning your environment, some lights emit heat. And, okay, I'm right next to um, an incandescent light, a little heat. But then multiply it by what you're doing in a multi-level uh, benched greenhouse. That heat is a huge issue. So invest in lighting that generates the least amount of heat and that's less heat that you have to deal with. And then also air movement. You need to make sure when you design your greenhouse that you have, you don't create microclimates, that it, you have uniformity, uniformity, uniformity. That back of the greenhouse isn't the subtropics and the front of the greenhouse isn't the desert. Make it all one, keep that air moving. And, um, you know, you, cooling pads, you know, the, 
make sure you understand the things you bring in the greenhouse, the limitations, because cooling pants have a distance limitation based on, you know, because by the time it gets to the end of the greenhouse, they're not as efficient. Yeah. So make sure that you match what you buy for the size of your greenhouse. By the way, a micromole is just a unit of measure. Yeah. You know, just, I mean, I throw that out there, but I know we've gone a little bit long. So, yeah, the um, micromole, this was a, what is a micromole? So, we, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you answered it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I threw it out here and it's kind of, it's something I use and I'm, you know, I'm comfortable with because I'm in and out of greenhouses, but, but really it's just a unit of measure. And it's something that, you know, if I'm selling you lighting, I'll, I'll throw that out there, you know. So, you know, hopefully what we learned today. You're going to design your irrigation system around certain variables. I, I like dual systems that have the capability of doing fogging for climate control, propagation, fertigation, chemigation with irrigation systems because you're going to build your infrastructure. You might as well have that dual system in day one. Mm -hmm. You need to know how much I, can I afford to invest and walk away very happy. You need to know the historical relative humidity for the area. That's very important. And then you also need to invest in a qualified builder that understands the concept of biosecurity. We're not building a building and just walls and a roof. And th this is a, you know, th this is a sterile environment that you're trying to create. And then you're introducing living organisms in the soil and you want to make sure that they have a nice, healthy environment. And they're not competing for resources. You know, I want what I want in that soil to grow and I don't want to introduce things that will compete for nutrients. You need to understand your competition. You know, what makes Costa successful? It's efficiency. That's it. They're very efficient. Um, understand, you know, some, some of the competition is aging out, which goes to the original concept of, is there room for me in the future to expand? In a lot of cases, they'll welcome you because this is their legacy. So, and then, you know, actually build your team, build your team. Work with an experienced dealer um, that stocks the product so that when you run out of 50 heads on a Sunday, you can call them and they'll be waiting for you. Know, that type of thing. That's really important. Use the resources of the IA. I think that's very important. Always think towards expansion, grow or die mentality, because you know, if you're successful, you're going to want to expand and don't, don't have that what if mentality. Invest in labor-saving equipment. There's a ton of it out there. You know, there's a lot of companies that are, that their focus is really saving labor, uh, whether it's rolling benches that allow you to eliminate walkways, or it's, um, you know, basically you can use a pallet bench and you can grow on a pallet and roll it right to a truck, depending on what you're growing. Um, learn about best management practices. I really believe that. Enjoy the camaraderie of this business. People really get, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. It's a different environment. Go, go in there at, with a mindset of I'm going to be part of a team that, that's doing something really important and develop your support network. Here's just a quick example of when I say best management practices, this is a publication that was done in Florida that I was involved in. And it lays out BMPs for nitrate infiltration because my aquifer is literally, you know, in certain places in Florida, three feet below the ground is my wow. drinking water. Yeah, it's crazy. And then, um, you know, you should be able to pull out a, out a greenhouse if, if you do it correctly, proper zoning, and everything else, and they'll never know you were there. You know, so you're going to you're going to improve the environment. You're going to achieve consistent uniform results. I mean, normally this presentation would be uniformity would have been said at least 100 times because it's that important and that you have to make sure that you're profitable. So you always you're always managing your your cost. If you're successful, you should be able to walk into that greenhouse and look at a bench and say that bench made me X amount of money today. And then invest in technology. Okay, so you don't need to go as far as um, you know. This is basically tissue culture being put in for pots. So you're going from one trade to another. It's really, you don't need to be there. But if you look at um, at this um, drippers, single outlet drippers that are put in where this is great is, okay, I've got to clean up between crops. I can just roll this up now. Mm. I don't have to disassemble anything. I can put it on a rolling table, put it out of the way, go on the zero tall, clean everything and I'm done. 
if you look at the item on the right, I'm buying my soil now in bulk. Every time I touch something in a greenhouse, so the estimate is it costs seven cents. So if I'm opening a bag, seven cents. If I'm carrying that soil to a place in seven cents, I'm paying for the bag, paying for it. So if you buy your soil in bulk and you invest it, there are a lot of these out there that are used and just basically just breaks up big bulk soil. Put that right next to your potting station. That cost of filling that pot with soil went from meant to, you know, it's now 21 cents where it could be as high as 75 cents. But now multiply that by 100,000 and then realize that 100,000 is going to happen every three months. Yeah. So there's a lot of good use. It doesn't have to be pretty. So I deliberately included that. And then, you know, like, again, invest in automation from start to finish. Um, there's some really cool things out there. Um, look at some of the, of the big trade shows, greenhouse trade show, cultivate. I would recommend anybody that's interested in getting this injury stop by cultivate. It's in, it's in July. Definitely worth seeing. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Kevin, wow, what a great presentation. I've learned so much about the greenhouse industry that I didn't know uh, before today. So uh, thank you. And I'll tell you, that's a really generous offer to put your phone number and email address uh, and an offer to, hey, call me. I'll, I'll help you out. Um, I know you're a busy anybody, guy. So. Anybody knows me, I carry two. I'm always okay. available. <laughs> no, I love Richard. I love this industry. I, I I'm involved in row crop too. I equally love row crop, but this actually gets me excited. And I have seen people become very successful. There was actually someone who loved this industry so much that he would take you. You you want to join? He had a four year contract for you, and after that four years, everything you everything that you uh, owned was paid for because he was seventy years old and he wanted to leave a legacy. So. He, he actually trained some of the best growers in Apopka, but it's a fun industry and, and it's needed, you know. Well, so. it is. And it's neat that it's an industry where uh, people get along and uh, and try to help other people be successful yeah. in the industry because uh, there's um, there's plenty of business to go around. So uh, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, well, thank you very much, Richard. Appreciate yeah. the opportunity. Thank you again, Kevin, and to all of you watching, thanks very much for uh, tuning in today. Uh, as you know, we've got uh, well over 300 trainings at uh, janesusa.com forward slash trainings. Uh, they're all free. And a lot of them uh, also uh, are credits toward your Irrigation Association annual education credits. So take advantage of that. We're also uh, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. So uh, again, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see you back here in a few weeks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Kevin.